Your Excellency, Foreign Minister of the Republic of Indonesia, Dr. Martin Natalagawa, Dean of the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, Professor Andrew McIntyre. Your Excellencies, representatives of the diplomatic community, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the Centre for Democratic Institutions 2012 Annual Address. At the outset, let me acknowledge the first Australians on whose land we meet and whose cultures, which are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history, we celebrate, the Ngunnawal people. My name is Stephen Sherlock. I'm the director of the Centre for Democratic Institutions, or CDI. CDI is Australia's leading democracy promotion organisation. We were established by the Australian government in 1998, a year of great change in Indonesia. Our mandate is to focus on the strengthening of parliaments and political parties in Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Our particular emphasis is on Indonesia and East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu and Fiji. CDI is funded by AusAid as part of the Australian Overseas Development Assistance Program. And we are hosted here at ANU in the Crawford School of Economics and Government in the College of, the, of Asia and the Pacific. Now the movement, the movement for political change, free expression and democracy has made great strides over uh, recent times. The exciting, inspiring and yet sometimes tragic events that have occurred in North Africa and the Middle East have been the cause of great hope, yet concern and speculation. And one of CDI's roles is to consider and discuss about how Australia's democratic experience might be helpful to countries in our region. We do this through training courses in parliamentary governance and political party development, through applied research and scholarship. Australia, in turn, will learn and be enriched through this interchange. Now, as part of our effort, each year we host an annual address delivered by a leading political figure or scholar. Now, a speaker this afternoon fits not one, but both of those categories. And it's our pleasure to give him the opportunity to return to his own, uh, his own intellectual home here at ANU and to exchange ideas with people on the campus today. And I'm very pleased that Dr. Natalgawa has agreed to take questions from the audience following this address. The CDI address is an opportunity to bring key issues relating to democracy in the region and democracy around the world to an Australian audience. Because today, it is not only long established democracies such as our own that are joining the effort to assist the forces of change in new democracies. Indeed, many Democrats in Africa or in the Middle East, for example, are sometimes more comfortable when seeking inspiration from the experience of countries such as Indonesia, countries that have transformed themselves in the last decade or more. Arguably, Indonesia has not received enough, enough credit, both in Australia and internationally for the great progress that it has made in rebuilding and then consolidating its own democratic institutions since the late 1980s, 1990s. And so it's for reasons such as this that we have invited and are very glad to welcome our distinguished guest here this afternoon. We are honoured to have an eminent national leader from our near neighbour to address us. Ladies and gentlemen, I have pleasure in calling upon our Dean, Professor Andrew McIntyre, to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, Foreign Minister of the Republic of Indonesia, uh, Dr. Marty Natalagawa. Ibu Sranya Natalagawa. Indonesian Ambassador Pa Primo Alui Julianto. 
High Commissioner of Malaysia, Mr. Salman Ahmed. High Commissioner of Papua New Guinea, Dr. Charles Lapani. Honourable Julie Bishop. And anyone else in the room who's distinguished. <laughs> uh, welcome. Uh, uh, great pleasure to have you here. Um, uh, great pleasure to have you here at the Australian National University, uh, and particularly for the uh, annual CDI address. Uh, it's a personal pleasure for me, uh, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, uh, to be able to uh, uh, introduce Pat Marty. Um, uh, he was appointed as the Foreign Minister of Indonesia uh, on the 22nd of October 2009. Prior to his appointment as Foreign Minister, he served as the permanent representative of the Republic of Indonesia to the United Nations in New York from 2007 to 2009. Um, among his responsibilities as the uh, permanent rep for Indonesia uh, was as the President of the Security Council uh, in November 2007, uh, Chairman uh, of the Se Security Council Sanction Committee uh, on the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2007 to 2008. See if this helps. Uh, chairman of the Asia Group uh, in October 2008. Co-facilitator of the President of the General Assembly for the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Chairman of the UN Special Committee on Decolonization uh, for 2008-2009. Um, uh, Pat Marty's also led uh, Indonesia's uh, delegations at just innumerable, innumerable uh, multilateral negotiations and meetings of one sort or another. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science from the Long School of Economics, a Master of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge, and as you would guess, I'm delighted to say, uh, a, do a Doctor of Philosophy from the Australian National University. Um, colleagues, that's the official stuff it says here on the uh, script I've been given. Um, and that's all true uh, and important. But Patmati uh, Ibusranya, on behalf of everyone uh, here in this room, uh, I just want to say how delighted we are uh, to have the two of you uh, with us, uh, particularly at this university, given its just historic role globally uh, in work on Indonesia. Um, uh, in this country and more broadly, uh, you're recognised as, as one of the outstanding foreign ministers of your country. You're recognised as one of the outstanding foreign ministers going around in this part of the world today. And uh, I would say uh, it's not just uh, uh, the citizens uh, of your country uh, but also the citizens uh, of this country and a number of other countries in the region are really fortunate uh, that you're in the job uh, that you are. Uh, you're seen as a voice of reason, a voice of principle uh, and a voice of wisdom uh, in regional and international affairs. So official stuff aside, that's what I really want to say, um, uh, and, to, and to welcome you warmly uh, back to the ANU. Dr. Stephen Sherlock, the director of the Center for Democratic Institutions, Professor Andrew McIntyre, dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific, the Honorable Julie Bishop, thank you for being here, uh, Honorable, and uh, excellencies from the various diplomatic missions here in Jakarta, in uh, Canberra. <laughs> I had just arrived about 45 minutes ago, uh, I'm afraid. If I seem a bit incoherent, please uh, take that into account. Uh, I, hope, I, hope, I hope I'm more coherent on the substantive matters. But uh, most of all, all uh, uh, colleagues uh, whom I would not be able to uh, acknowledge, uh, each and every one of you, uh, Ambassador of the High Commissioner of Singapore, pa, it's good to see you again. We were together in London, of course. Um, but not most of all, uh, not least, I would like to acknowledge uh, Indonesian uh, students who are here at the ANU. Uh, I hope what I'm about to say uh, will not dissuade you from joining the public service, the service of our uh, great country, and, and uh, I hope and I'm sure all of you in different shape and form will contribute to the Indonesia's future. 
Uh, both uh, Dr. Sherlock as well as Professor McIntyre have been too generous, I must say, in, in introducing the way myself in the way that they have done. Uh, actually, actually, the privilege and the honor is is mine, uh, and uh, in having this great opportunity to be able to speak before uh, such a August forum and before such a uh, you know this collective wisdom of, of, of knowledge and, and, and all that so I am really grateful for this opportunity and I wish especially to acknowledge the important role of the Center of for democratic institutions uh, in Australia no doubt but beyond to the region as you have just now described uh, Dr. Sherlock uh, we in Indonesia as we transform we are only too aware of the importance of uh, capacity building, uh, democratic capacity building, the institutions of democracy. Because uh, even with the very best of uh, intentions, uh, political will and, and conviction and determination, in the final analysis, all those must be translated, uh, transformed and manifested in actual institutions uh, on which uh, the whole enterprise will be built. And that is why I wish to acknowledge uh, the importance of the CDI uh, in promoting uh, the development and the capacity building of democratic institutions, including in my own uh, country. I would like, if I may, uh, speak on the, on the theme of uh, change, especially democratic change, and how uh, that subject may have or has had an impact on Indonesian uh, foreign policy uh, because I think this is one of the uh, one of the most important issue how change is uh, responded to how change is uh, managed but I prefer not to simply respond or manage change but rather to be an agent for change to actually bring about uh, change, to be in more proactive role in actually uh, uh, promoting change for the better, for the promotion of democracy in a way that uh, we have been trying to do over the past uh, one year. Now, uh, all of you, no doubt, in this uh, August Hall would be very much aware that if we speak of change, uh, transformation even, uh, Indonesia is one country uh, that you can say over the past decade or so has gone through uh, plenty of those. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Indonesia from the 1998 onwards, we have not only undergone uh, changes, but also I would believe, I would argue, uh, fundamental transformation. Um, the facts are obviously uh, well known, but just to recall, 1998 onwards, the original financial crisis, the uh, economic crisis, the multidimensional crisis that Indonesia went through, uh, both first economic and then become, became uh, political, have been truly of a staggering uh, nature. And uh, we in Indonesia have been trying to uh, manage that process in as good a manner as possible. But I think 10 years hence, a decade or so after the initiation of those changes, I can say that the um, scorecard insofar as Indonesia is concerned is not uh, too um, negative or too pessimistic. We have, for example, in the political domain, a fundamental transformation uh, of a political system from what was then an authoritarian uh, country to what is now the third world's third largest uh, democracy. Now we are the first one to acknowledge that ours is not a democracy that is absent of problems and challenges. As a matter of fact, um, day in and day out, we are constantly reminded of the shortcomings and the failings and the challenges that we still face in terms of our uh, democracy, in terms of our, of our governance issues. But on the whole, it is, I think, to the um, benefit, to the advantage of the region to have uh, witnessed and to have had 
this democratic transformation uh, taking place in Indonesia to, as I said, what was once an authoritarian state to what is now the world's third largest democracy and at the same time uh, the world's largest uh, Muslim populated uh, population country which proves that Islam, democracy and modernity can actually go hand in hand. Uh, when we recall and, and recall that developments in Middle East, North Africa just now, the uh, very difficult process of change that is taking place in some of the countries in that region, then clearly what had transpired uh, in Indonesia can be of some uh, relevance uh, to those countries. Uh, now, the democratic transformation uh, in terms of political system and governance have had its democratic dividend in various uh, domain and areas. In the economic area, for example, we had uh, transformed ourselves from a country that went through very difficult uh, economic conditions. The IMF had to come in to basically rescue our economy to what is now a permanent member of the G20 group of nations. Now, um, at the same time, for example, at the time when much of the world is uh, undergoing, going through difficult financial crisis, uh, Indonesia's economy, as the rest of the Southeast Asian economies and Australia, have remained largely uh, resilient to those uh, difficult situations. In other words, the uh, democratic de dividend has been obvious in the political domain, certainly as well in the economic uh, domain as well. I should have mentioned just now in the political domain, uh, in terms of the dividend that we, were, we have been able to harvest, is also the resolution of various internal conflict situations. Aceh comes especially to mind. 30 years, uh, thir three decades or so of conflict, we were able to resolve in a manner uh, that is uh, satisfactory to all concerned. Timor-Leste's own uh, separation from Indonesia, admittedly extremely difficult and sometimes painful process, but the change that was taking place in Indonesia uh, concurrently with the change that was taking place in the status of Timor, East Timor made it possible for both of us to move on, to move forward rather than uh, looking back. In other words, the economic dividend, economic domain, political domain, there's been uh, the democratic dividend of our transformation. But in my uh, line of work, I am really looking for the dividend in its foreign policy. I have been tasked with this uh, responsibility as Foreign Minister of Indonesia only uh, relatively recently, but very much had an opportunity in previous capacities, uh, almost like a blank canvas. I remember even uh, when I was still in, uh, as a PR in New York or ambassador in London, being invited to come to the ANU to speak at one of the forums here. I think I spoke about the democratization of Indonesian foreign policy uh, then. And I think now we are trying to put that into effect. And let me uh, give some examples how the democratization, the transformation within Indonesia is manifesting itself in its uh, foreign policy outlook and foreign policy uh, action as well. In terms of process, for example, the process of foreign policy making in Indonesia is now far more complex than it has ever been. Now we have to involve uh, stakeholders uh, beside the government, the parliament, uh, civil society and other stakeholders must be engaged and involved in the, promotion, in the formulation of foreign policy so that we create a sense of ownership uh, in the foreign policy that emanates from uh, that policy making process. But in terms of the actual substance, let me just turn to our own immediate uh, neighborhood, namely uh, Southeast Asia. I remember when Indonesia chaired ASEAN in 2003, about, about three or four years after the beginning of our reform process, when we began to do foreign policy once more, because the uh, internal difficulties, I think, to be honest, had caused us in the initial 
period of the reform, reformacy period to turn inwards. But when we began to look at ASEAN once again, we decided then that to bring about the, the language and the uh, issues of democracies and good governance to ASEAN uh, consideration. You would recall, for example, back in 2002-2003, ASEAN was speaking of an ASEAN economic community, uh, not of security community and not of socio-cultural community. It was Indonesia, together with the ASEAN, ASEAN colleagues, countries, that introduced the notion of ASEAN security community, bringing on board issue of political govern uh, good governance, democracy, human rights, to ASEAN. I remember very clearly uh, that effort was often questioned um, and sometimes uh, wondered why it is that we are bringing what is actually internal political issues onto the ASEAN setting. But we were thinking not of ASEAN 2003, but ASEAN of 2020 and 2015 uh, in terms of ASEAN community. We were keen to ensure that the democratic transformation taking place in Indonesia was not, is not an aberration uh, disconnected from the region at large. Because if we were to have a democratic Indonesia in a sea or, or an environment where there is a democratic deficit, uh, that disconnect can create all kind of uh, complications uh, for all concerned. Uh, that is why purposefully and deliberately we brought the subject of uh, democracy, human rights through the ASEAN security community into the ASEAN portfolio ever since 2003 to ensure that there is a synergy in terms of the transformation taking place in our country with the rest of the region. Not by way of extrapolating or exporting even, more, even less our national experience because if there is one lesson learned that we, we had, we had uh, drawn is that democracy must be homegrown, it cannot be imposed from outside, uh, but nonetheless we felt it was important that we proceed in that manner. Now of course since then, uh, 10 years later or so, we have seen the capacity building uh, institutions of ASEAN on democracy. In other words, not only have we been building national democratic institutions concurrently and at the same time not sequential, concurrently and at the same time, at a different pace perhaps, we are also building ASEAN's democratic institutions. There was that uh, very self-absorbed motivation that I had mentioned just now to ensure that developments in Indonesia is not disconnected from developments in the region, but there was also a more real politic uh, reason as well. We felt that the absence of uh, an ASEAN layer on human rights and democracy means that whenever there is an issue to do with democracy and human rights, we will quickly see situation develop from the national level to the global level. Uh, not unlike Indonesia's own case. When Indonesia faced the situation on uh, Timor-Leste or East Timor, the issue was immediately brought to the United Nations. There was no ASEAN construct there was no ASEAN layer uh, to be able to address uh, the issue. Having such an ASEAN democratic institutions and capacities is uh, consistent with Indonesia's outlook, but at the same time it makes sense. It is not only smart, but also it is right, uh, because it also provides ASEAN with another option uh, in dealing with uh, that type of issues. Now contrast uh, developments elsewhere nowadays in North Africa and in the Middle East where the democratic deficit uh, quickly becomes uh, security issues. And, and ASEAN, while we have been developing in a very relatively uh, steady pace, but it is one, a pace that is comfortable to all and one that is, uh, I think, in the long run going to have a greater sense of ownership than would otherwise be the case. But the promotion of democratic values and the promotion of democratic uh, principles, human rights and good governance is not only about uh, institution capacity building, 
we wish sometimes it was, because if that was the case, then it can be brought about overnight. It can simply be legislated and, and just happen uh, very quickly. But it is a process, uh, not an event. And here, I think, is where Indonesia has been trying to also influence the course of events by providing our own case study, a case, as a reference, as a lessons learned for others to be able to, to, to see its relevance to their own national situations. I use those uh, terms in a very guarded way because, as I said before, there's, it's n there's no one size fits all. Uh, every country has a unique situation and conditions, but uh, we have not been shy in ASEAN to present our problems uh, in the hope that problems, not success, uh, we have not been shy in presenting our problems to the ASEAN uh, forum in the hope that it will engender a new kind of uh, a more transparent and, and, uh, and, uh, and willingness to share problems uh, type of attitude within ASEAN. And I think in the long run uh, it has worked uh, in, in different circumstances in ASEAN. I'm looking at, I'm thinking especially here of developments in Myanmar. Uh, as you have been aware, you would be aware, uh, we have been seeing over the past one year uh, a significant, not only significant, I think quite profound uh, pace of change in Myanmar. Now, um, I recall for many years uh, on Myanmar, it has become uh, countries cancelling one another's efforts. A group of countries believe that it is engagement that works, other group of countries believe it is uh, sanctions that works. But in the final analysis, we work diligently and, and patiently uh, with the authorities in Myanmar, uh, sharing lessons learned, uh, problems encountered, and hopefully engender peer encouragement as we have been doing. And now uh, it is beginning to uh, see the, um, the positive outcome. So in terms of our foreign policy, once again, democratization within Indonesia finding its manifestation in the regional outlook of Indonesia, institution building, formal institution building within ASEAN, less formal in terms of uh, sharing lessons learned and, and, and problems encountered so that other countries within ASEAN hopefully can adapt and, uh, adapt and adopt uh, Indonesia's uh, uh, learning ex experience. Uh, but beyond ASEAN, we have been also gradually expanding our efforts to what is called the Bali Democracy Forum, which is now entering its fifth year. Uh, this is uh, wider than ASEAN. This encompasses the Asia Pacific uh, in general. Again, uh, very modest in terms of not wanting to pontificate, but rather to, uh, to compare notes, to share lessons learned, and we have been doing that over the past five years with a very varied uh, group of countries. Uh, deliberately and purposefully, this is not one of those friends of uh, gathering, uh, gathering of the converted, uh, gathering of uh, like-minded. It is deliberately uh, countries with varying agenda, different outlook, so that we can truly get uh, a maximum value-adding uh, benefit from the process of uh, discussion among them. So ASEAN, capacity building, ASEAN, lessons learned uh, efforts, and then we have the uh, Bali Democracy Forum as well. A footnote in the region, uh, I don't want to expand on this too long, too, uh, too deeply, but I wish to say it nonetheless. Another change, uh, greater change in our outlook, following our democratic transformation is in terms of our views on the geopolitics of the region. Uh, they may, a question may be posed on this. Uh, it's not about democracy uh, issue per se, but our belief that the uh, geopolitics of our region uh, would uh, the, uh, the Asia Pacific uh, environment would benefit from avoidance of uh, Cold War type of competition and conflict, uh, the management or the containment of a rising uh, country, we believe, uh, is, uh, would see the return of uh, 
old style Cold War power politics type of conditions which would not be conducive to any one of us. Uh, that is why Indonesia has been promoting what we call a dynamic equilibrium for our region. Absent proprietary power, not brought about by a coalition of forces, but rather through uh, concepts such as common security, common prosperity, and common stability. Um, again, I, th I believe this is a, a product of our democratization uh, and transformation within uh, Indonesia. One final point that I would like to say before if we have the opportunity to have uh, a question and answer uh, session. I have spoken about uh, democratic transformation within Indonesia. Um, I have not gone at length because I'm sure all of you are quite aware of it. I have uh, tried to make the case that the democratic transformation within Indonesia has had its uh, foreign policy impact in terms of uh, ASEAN by bringing issue of democratization onto ASEAN and as well as beyond ASEAN through Bali Democracy Forum and even in multilateral setting. But I believe that the, uh, our conversation would be incomplete if we stop at the issue of democratization only at the national level or at the, re at the regional level. Instead, we must also speak of democratization at the global level. Uh, namely here the issue of governance, the issue of reform of various multilateral institutions, whether it be the United Nations, whether it be the United Nations Security Council, or the IMF, the Bretton Woods system. Uh, we do sincerely believe that the effectiveness and the efficiency of some of these institutions are being affected by its sometimes outmoded uh, way of uh, way of work as well as its uh, membership as well. So we are keen to be able to translate, transform and project the democratization uh, uh, force and, and sentiment beyond national, beyond the region but also to the global uh, governance of, as well so that we can have truly a uh, possibility for countries, uh, large and small, to be able to contribute to the uh, promotion of international peace, security, as well as uh, prosperity. One final, final note for me, uh, from my own very humble, very limited experience and knowledge, uh, I do believe that change uh, can be brought about, positive change can be purposefully and deliberately uh, brought about with strong intent and strong uh, determination. Uh, we have been trying, I have been trying over the past two years or so to change uh, certain dynamics uh, from a vicious circle to a virtuous one. I've spoken at some length on the democratization path, but the similar effort is being done elsewhere on the South China Sea, for example, over the past one year when Indonesia chaired ASEAN, I hope we have begun a new, uh, more virtuous cycle in that part of the world through the um, agreement on the guidelines on the South China Sea. Now we are working on the code of conduct. We are doing likewise by ratifying the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Uh, Indonesia is one of the Annex II countries whose ratification is uh, required before the CTBT comes to effect. By doing so, I'm trying to have a positive, um, infectious impact to create others' uh, pressures, peer pressures for others to do likewise. South China Sea, Myanmar, I have spoken a little bit about on the CTBT, and even on the subject matter of my thesis here at the NU on the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Uh, over the past one year, uh, we have made, finally concluded the, uh, the uh, negotiations with the nuclear weapon states uh, so that they are able to accede to, this, to the Southeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. In other words, I think uh, we can make a difference, uh, foreign policies can make a difference in various areas of endeavor. And, and it's just a matter of getting down to, to doing it. We have a term in Indonesia just now about this, it's about waging peace. Uh, waging peace means we are as aggressive and as purposeful 
and as uh, deliberate and as uh, uh, strong will in promoting peace as we are often the case in uh, trying to promote uh, more less uh, benign intentions. Those are some of the ideas that I wish to share and I, had, uh, I hope I have not spoken too long and uh, I would be very happy if there was to be any questions, hopefully not too much complaints. <laughs> comprehensive presentation and what struck me most uh, about what you were saying was the phrase that you used that Indonesia's transformation has been not an event but a process and what really uh, struck me when thinking and listening to what you were saying was the, the complexity and the multifaceted nature of that uh, transformation the internal changes that had to happen in Indonesia, the economic recovery, rebuilding of democratic institutions after many years of authoritarian government, then re-establishing relationships within ASEAN. Then you talked about many of the issues that are uh, being dealt with regionally through ASEAN and through various other regional forums. And then, of course, what is so exciting is that by day, day by day, now Indonesia becoming more and more a player on the world stage. Uh, you mentioned the BDF, is course, of course, is one of the key instruments uh, through which that is occurring. And we in CDI are very glad to have a close partnership with the uh, Institute of Peace and Democracy, which is closely associated with uh, the, uh, the BDF. But if I may be frank with you, Pat, I think you've set us a very challenging task. And when I say us, I mean people such as ourselves in this room this afternoon, people who work on Indonesia all the time, who think about Indonesia all the time. The, one of the challenges that we have is that Indonesia is running so fast ahead of Australia. Not necessarily people such as ourselves, I hope, but popular attitudes in Australia are still a long way behind. Many people in Australia do not, I think, give due credit, as I said in my earlier presentation, what Indonesia has achieved. And the popular perceptions in many ways are about a decade behind. So it, it really is a statement, I think, to the impressive achievements of uh, Indonesia that you're leaving the Australian community behind. So for us here in this room, the CDI included, it's, it's a task to have the Australian community uh, to catch up um, with some of those changes. So with those few observations, let me uh, throw an open question from anyone from the floor. The lady there uh, was the first with her hand up, so the gentleman next to her uh, was next, so please. Thank you very much. Um, the lady first. Uh, my name is Yusuf Sawaki. I'm a PhD student here at ANU. I'm the linguistics uh, from West Papua. Indonesia and uh, my question is uh, you mentioned about democracy, democratic change and transformations that I agree part way. And uh, you mentioned also about the questions in uh, Indonesia about uh, the case of Aceh and also East Timor. Uh, but uh, we don't hear about West Papua that are still uh, have a conflict. And uh, my question is, how do you see the, uh, the conflict and how uh, Indonesia government deal with the conflict in West Papua? And also, a uh, couple months ago, the uh, Indonesian president mentioned about dialogue between uh, central government and uh, West Papua. How do you uh, see that uh, dialogue and how do you see it will be happen uh, in the near future? And last question is, why is uh, West Papua politically still restricted from international journalists and uh, human, humanitarians, workers and organizations till now? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that question and congratulations on your studies here at ANU and, and good luck to your research. Uh, no, I have not mentioned Papua in my remarks, but purposefully and deliberately because I knew there was going to be a good question on it. <laughs> Rather than preempting, uh, you know, with a half-baked uh, 
uh, presentation, I would rather actually address a specific question. And thank you for that. Yes, I have mentioned a number of uh, democratic dividends in Indonesia uh, post reformasi uh, in terms of political internal situation. I have mentioned how we were able to move on, move forward on Timor Leste. Uh, that would have been far more difficult, I believe, if Indonesia had remained what it was as, as Timor Leste said, went on its own way. Uh, likewise, I have mentioned Aceh. I think it would not have been possible if we have, if we do not have. Uh, popularly elected government with a strong mandate from the people to just would be able to deliver in bringing about uh, peace to, uh, to, uh, to Aceh. Papua, a number of dimensions uh, on the issue, West Papua, Papua. The issue of sovereignty, the issue of um, sovereignty issues, the legal status of Papua, I think that is no longer an issue uh, for any one of us, including especially in the international community. I think, uh, on, as a matter of fact, over the past few years especially, uh, I have begun to notice increasingly uh, even countries that had previously had less than uh, uh, full knowledge and appreciation of the nature of the problem in Papua have begun uh, to come around to be able to uh, to appreciate what is the actual nature of the problem or challenge in Papua. Uh, we have, for example, established a very close and, and uh, positive relations with countries such as Vanuatu. Uh, over the past one year, they are about to open an embassy in Jakarta. Uh, likewise, we have become a very active member of the Pacific Observer of the Pacific Island Forum, as well uh, observer of the Melanesian Spearhead Group, uh, which in the past we have kept sa somewhat uh, uh, distance. In other words, in so far as the diplomacy uh, of uh, the issue, I think it is quite the formal, legal, sovereignty issue, diplomacy, I think is quite uh, steady and, and quite uh, a non-issue. A non but there is still a, a challenge in Papua in terms of other aspects of problems, uh, challenges. One obvious dividend, one obvious democratic dividend insofar as uh, our addressing of the challenges in Papua is that we have now done away. We have now done away with the so-called security approach. Time and time again, we have the government had said, as a matter of fact, as a matter of policy, not only policy, but as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, emphasis on the so-called prosperity approach, kesejahteraan, to bring about uh, govern through better governance, through better uh, uh, empowerment of the through special autonomy, better development, and, and, and addressing of uh, injustice issues of the past in a better way. Now, one concrete manifestation of such uh, uh, prosperity rather than security approach is that whenever, and there's been quite a few still, occasions or incidences of uh, abuses takes place because of overzealous, over exuberant enforcement of the law uh, by certain individuals, uh, policemen or members of the PNI, in the past that kind of issue would have been swept under the carpet. But now, uh, contrary to the past, the issue is tackled head on not only by people like myself, but also even by persons such as the president himself. And uh, no impunity, accountability is always uh, placed as a priority, as a, as a matter of principle. Of course, in the course of uh, that effort, there is always room for improvement, space for, uh, to, do, to do things better. And we would like to uh, invite and encourage the civil society and others to be able to point us the way how we can deliver better in that uh, prosperity approach. Having said that, having said that, the reality is, the reality whether we like it or not, the reality is in West Papua, there are still elements who are actually waging and fighting for uh, separation through um, the use of armed violence. Now, you have to tell me 
what can anyone, anyone of you perhaps can tell me, if there is any country in the world that would uh, allow uh, when challenged in that way, when individuals, non-state entities and actors uh, take up arms, it is the responsibility of the state to be able to maintain uh, public order, to be able to maintain law. I don't want to use the term law and order because it sounds so whatever. Public order, I think, is the best, the best terminology. Uh, that is the reality. And that is why if we have certain uh, management uh, procedures for our friends to visit uh, the province, including journalists, it is primarily to ensure that we do not uh, bring uh, discomfort and safety issues to those who are in Papua. Because there is uh, the best way, I guess, for anyone to bring global worldwide attention uh, to the issue in Papua would be to bring harm uh, to, uh, you know, for example, journalists. But by the way, on this issue, I have on various occasions in Jakarta asked our uh, foreign media colleagues uh, who had applied and who had been able to go and who have not been able to go. Uh, in most instances, uh, the record is not as as uh, as uh, as uh, negative as one would like to think. But that's that's my general uh, answer uh, to the remarks. Appreciate very much your question. It is uh, something that I think is very fair for us to be concerned about uh, developments in Papua, Western Papua. Uh, we appreciate very much the position of countries like Australia that have support, supported us as a matter of principle. But we need to ensure that we not simply abuse uh, that trust, but rather we on our own, we have to deliver by bringing uh, better governance better uh, human rights uh, respect for in the province of Papua. Thank you for the question. Terima kasih. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Budi Rizosudarmo. I'm uh, currently the head of the Indonesian project. Oh, Budi, could we just watch my remarks? <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity, Ma. My name is Bukhir Sosudan, I'm currently head of the Indonesia project. Uh, last year we have an update with the title Indonesia's Place in the World. So precisely, uh, reason we do it precisely because it seemed to many observers that um, there has been a demand that Indonesia playing a much major role in the international policy and international trade, while in reality it doesn't seem that Indonesia doing that, uh, that role. And one of the reasons is uh, a policy constraint, in which, you know, exactly what you have mentioned, that you put the stress that the way that Indonesia reached the world is through a ASEAN, one of them, ASEAN, in which some of us think, could think that, well, it is a longer path that could bring us to the world, uh, meaning that actually it could be a constraint. In it. Uh, and second, so that, so my question is that you know, putting those emphasis on using those layers before we reaching the world, is it really necessary? Or you mentioned that you were afraid a little bit because there will be if there is a situation in which we are going through fight and we will caught up in a situation, you know, like a cold, uh, cold war situation. Probably you think about China at the moment, but you know. That's probably the challenge that we, we, we have to take. Yeah? Or yeah, there's other constraints that you have in mind, probably domestic constraints, you know, human resources that we cannot control what happened. So what is it really? Uh, in which, you know, what I would like to convey is that international people do want Indonesia to move faster. Well, thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much for the question. We, we can actually actually, we can walk and whistle at the same time. It's uh, under seals, under the jalan. Uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that actually, in practice, it is not an either-or, thankfully. It is not as if, do ASEAN, don't do the world. 
Look the world, don't do ASEAN. ASEAN is constraining. A good form policy of the 21st century is to be able to connect the dots, to be able to move up and down the continuum, region, national, regional, global, national, regional, global, going up and down uh, that level. If one is stuck at one level, and I said there will be one moment in time when somehow you are, you are enlightened, okay, we can shut this one and then we move on to do the world. That time will never come. And I think that is one of the strength of Indonesia's diplomacy. Uh, Papa recalled just now, I have mentioned, when Indonesia transformed 1980 to 1998 onwards, democratic and therefore in a very humble, low-key, not pontificating, comfort level, everyone on the same page, we try to bring ASEAN together with us, at least to ensure synergy. Democratization as a, as a topic in Indonesia, democratization with some lesser speed perhaps in ASEAN, at least synergy. I am aware of this so-called dilemma that some of our colleagues in Jakarta got, became very excited about two or three years ago, as if we are now G20, let's not no longer do ASEAN. As I said, it is a misnomer, it is a misplaced dilemma. Why? Because it would be impossible, impossible for Indonesia to be going to do the world, so to speak, without having a strong grounding in our own region. Not a stepping stone, because the, the region is our, our family. Stepping stone as if, is as if you need that pedestal to be able to move on. No, we can, we have, Indonesia is very proud of its multilateral tradition, but even in 1955, we were barely independent and, and sustainable. We were able to organize the Asia-Africa conference that brought together Asia and Africa. And that tradition remains. But what we have been doing in ASEAN, and this is where I, I want the point that I wanted to make. In Bali last year, in November 2011, we adopted what we call Bali Concord 3, ASEAN community in a global community of nations. How to ensure that ASEAN speaks with greater voice on global issues, climate change, food security, etc., etc. Not overnight, but in the same way as ASEAN community building in 10 years' time, 2022. What is that? It is an attempt to ensure that as Indonesia is doing increasingly global multilateral outlook, at the same time, there is no leaving anyone behind. It is actually all of us moving together. It is a strategic, deliberate, synergic, win-win, no one loses out effort. Um, look at some other sub-regions, Baba. I don't want to mention the sub-region concern because I don't want to be unfriendly to any particular ambassador. Uh, there is another sub-region here to Southeast Asia with some other large country within it. And that large country can be so profoundly important that the regional architecture does not have a chance to develop. It is suffocating. Too much is being embraced that is suffocating. Indonesia's diplomacy is less is more. By restraint, we are allowing things to prosper and develop. Tell me of another situation like Indonesia. Indonesia is one of the largest countries in Southeast Asia. I don't use the word the largest, but certainly one of the significant ones. But when a problem arises between fellow ASEAN countries, as it did just now, last year, Thailand, Cambodia, they turn to Indonesia to help facilitate. It is not often, I think, when the larger country in a sub-region is the country that is seen to be uh, most uh, uh, able to bring others. This quality of the group, this, this quality, we earn this. We earn it through our uh, diplomacy, not through our objective conditions per se. It is a process, and, and I hope colleagues uh, can understand the need to be able to manage this development. I use the term, the president used the term, Indonesia is a regional power, with global interests and with global concerns. We are regional power, 
but we have global interests and global concerns. So pick any subject you wish to pick and see where we are on the subject matter. So uh, this dilemma, it is a misnomer, it is misplaced. As I said before, we can walk and whistle at the same time. Uh, we don't have to switch one, one off before doing the other. Terima kasih. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the point you just made about as Indonesia rises to become a globally more significant power. Uh, and a comment which your illustrious former finance minister made in a public lecture here at AMU last year, Dr. Sri Mulyani Indrawati, the point that uh, she made was that as Indonesia becomes globally more significant, as is clearly evident, uh, it's going to need the kind of the deep analytical understanding of of the world, in a sense, to be able to be an effective, uh, a more effective uh, player in the world. Uh, she lamented, for example, the fact that you have recently lost probably your most knowledgeable person outside of government in East Asia, that is the late Dr. Hadi Sosastro. And uh, she pointed out, that she argued the case for saying that Indonesia needs you know, deep scholarship, deep analytical understanding of you know, India, of China, hopefully also Australia, and many other countries. Uh, and that's, that's outside government. Of course, the diplomatic work that you, you and your department do is the most important, but in a way it draws on, to be more effective, it has to draw on that deep base. And I wonder what you think about that. These things can't be switched on quickly. They take you know, a generation. But I wonder if you think you're moving quickly enough in the direction of establishing that strong uh, I agree fully with uh, her, her analysis uh, just now, uh, as described by Yupa. Um, intellectual leadership is as important as uh, diplomatic leadership. Uh, we must be at the forefront in uh, recognizing the big issues of the day of our region and coming up with, with uh, answers. Um, we, I am not pessimistic, as a, as a matter of fact, with the, uh, uh, I'm not talking here of numbers, but certainly of uh, quality of, uh, of our uh, academics and researchers, uh, very much our strong partners in the elaboration of our foreign policy, but we must not be neglectful. Uh, I have been saying to my colleagues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we must have a good scorecard, a snapshot, of who is what and who is what and doing what is the kind of research interest that they have to be able to ensure that there's good uh, synergy between the uh, practitioners, so to speak, and the academics, so that is, we can uh, support one another and come up with good policies. Um, notwithstanding that challenge, I would like to think, uh, uh, if you were uh, to look at the region, for example, we have been trying, and I believe we have provided the kind of uh, intellectual leadership uh, over the recent past. Of course, there's now ASEAN uh, security community building, uh, democracy, human rights, I had mentioned, uh, and beyond. And also the whole debate on the regional architecture building, uh, the, uh, the East Asia summits, uh, addition of US and Russia, the Bali principles adopted uh, at the last East Asia Summit, uh, similar to the DAC, Treaty of Amitian Cooperation, but covering the entire East Asia Summit participants. These are some issues that I think uh, are evident of our intellectual contribution to our uh, region's uh, discourse on matter to do with international relations. Thank you. Is there <clears throat> thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Chris Roberts from the uh, National Security College. Uh, thank you for a very eloquent uh, presentation, which I think is exemplary of the kind of achievements uh, that uh, Indonesia has made uh, on the democratic front. In a way, my question uh, follows from Hal Hills, but sort of in the reverse, in the sense that uh, I think uh, Australian-Indonesian relations are, are very positive at the moment. There are, of course, always hiccups and hurdles and and, uh, and, and caveats, uh, but also with the democratic nexus in mind, the, the values of Indonesia in many ways, I think, uh, I agree with the earlier statement that uh, are, are sort of not fully appreciated perhaps just how far Indonesia has, has come, 
particularly in its foreign policy, look at, for example, uh, the, the wording of the Institute of Peace and Democracy, and, and those terms as compared to, say, uh, uh, my own college, the National Security College, and then the, the, uh, the terminology or emphasis uh, uh, there. So I guess my, my question is, given that there's actually been a convergence of, of values between the two countries, what opportunities and also constraints do you see in terms of uh, the Australian side of the picture, uh, Australian uh, bilateral relations with Indonesia actually improving even further in the future? What can Australia do to, to build a, a better relationship, a better understanding of Indonesia? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I'm here in Canberra uh, for the purpose of having a bilateral with my colleague, uh, the recently appointed uh, Minister of Affairs of uh, Australian, uh, Ms. Boka, as well as uh, to initiate a new process. It's called the 2 plus 2, uh, where for the first time, uh, Indonesia, the four ministers of Australia and Indonesia will be meeting uh, in a forum together with the defense ministers. So it's 2 plus 2. So this is a new forum uh, in recognition of the close interlinkage between uh, defense issues and foreign policy issues that will take place tomorrow. Uh, Australia is a very important partner of Indonesia, comprehensive partner is how we describe it. We have the Lombok Treaty as the, the foundation of our bilateral relations. Uh, you are quite uh, correct in, uh, in recognizing that um, at the same time we have had our uh, issues that we need to manage uh, in recent years and no doubt there will be many more to come because we are after all neighbors. Uh, but to be honest, I have been able to work where it was before with uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, previously Dr. Uh, Stephen Smith when he was the uh, Foreign Minister of Australia, in a very, very effective way. Uh, I could not think of an issue that where we confront a problem, we were driven by a wedge between us. Actually, we were able to immediately see the big picture that this is an issue that we both need to address in a, in a holistic, comprehensive, mutually beneficial way. Uh, and, and that kind of outlook we are trying to preserve. Uh, in terms of uh, challenge, I think we have a perception challenge. Um, on the one hand, relations actually are quite robust and quite strong, right? government to government, but sometimes uh, among the public, uh, both uh, in Australia and Indonesia, is either one of uh, lack of knowledge, uh, lack of awareness, or if there were to be some awareness, it tends to be a little bit of uh, the usual uh, stereotype uh, kind. That's my problem uh, and my business to address, but it is a process. Again, there is no shortcut to this. We must have a better people-to-people -people interaction, uh, exchanges among students, among academics, so that we understand one another better. Uh, what keeps, uh, you know, what motivates uh, our two countries in terms of issues. But all in all, I think all in all, I must say the, the relations between our two countries, uh, you know, have never been as close as they are today. And and I am very confident that uh, whatever problems or challenges you face, we are going to be able to address them. But uh, we have now an annual leaders meeting between the Prime Minister and the President, uh, which take place, uh, which took place last time in Bali last November. We'll be having another one hopefully in Australia come uh, next May. And then uh, we have the 2 plus 2 and then we have the uh, uh, people to people contacts as well. But this is a uh, relationship that needs to be nurtured, that needs to be developed, and that, may, that must be made contemporary and modern as well. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Nathan Ramia. I'm doing my Masters of International Relations here at the ANU. Um, as my last student, I found much in the literature that Asian ASEAN is no more than um, a talk shop. That our biggest flaw is um is the ASEAN way, the so-called ASEAN way, the not non-interference authority. Um, how do uh, you as um, an active actor uh, at the ASEAN diplomacy, how do you see, uh, this, uh, how do you interpret the principle of um, sovereignty and especially ASEAN way? Um, 
because you talk about democratization, and one of the principles of democratization is transparency, uh, and also in the context of, of global interdependence. Do you see a change um, in that? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, the, the first point is that the uh, principle of sovereignty and non-interference, etc. They are not uh, an ASEAN monopoly. Uh, funnily enough, all the 190-odd countries, members of the UN, all of them also subscribe to this. Uh, Non-interference, sovereignty, uh, internal, external, so everyone uh, does so. Uh, but nonetheless, despite uh, that principle, other countries and other regions have been able to develop concern and sensitivity about matters to do with human rights and good governance and democracy. In other words, there is nothing inherently inimical, nothing inherently uh, in conflict between uh, human rights concern, democracy, and non-interference and, and, and uh, sovereignty. What we have been doing over one over the past 10 years or so in ASEAN is precisely to drive home that message. Please don't be too self-absorbed. Uh, don't think there is anything specially unique about ASEAN. All of us have those concerns. Legally speaking, as a matter of law, as a matter of uh, basic principles. But we can still do the things that we need to do in terms of mutual concern, etc. But we have not gone you know, overboard in suddenly becoming uh, pontificating, telling anyone what to do. As I said, when Indonesia changed, trans began to its transformation, we purposefully and deliberately uh, you know, tried to have a positive impact by disclosing our problems simply by sharing the problems that we have. Not our successes, our problems from Aceh, Papua, uh, um, many, many other human rights situations, so that it can create a comforting effect that actually all of us can do the same. And over the past 10 years, and especially over the past two or three years, we have seen a real, real paradigm shift within ASEAN. Now, when ASEAN foreign ministers come together, uh, it is the norm, Yambaku, it is the norm to share problems, to expect support, and etc. So the so-called ASEAN way is not carved in stone, it is evolving. Uh, and now I think it's evolving in a more, uh, in a more positive direction uh, to suggest and to impress that there is no uh, disconnect. As I said before, Look at developments now happening in Myanmar. Uh, very, very deliberate. Sometimes you accelerate, sometimes you de decelerate, sometimes you push, sometimes you hold back. Uh, very, very well time and very nuanced. Sometimes uh, you know, engendering impatience on the part of other other countries who are far more inclined to do the big, you know, carrying huge stick or even offering in by saying carrot. But countries are not donkeys. Yeah. I mean you don't you don't do stick and you don't do carrot. You encourage. You have peer encouragement. That's a, that's what I think what ASEAN is all about. Look at what has happened over the past three decades or so. Almost every decade Southeast Asia has provided uh, net benefit, net net contributor to democracy from Thailand and from Philippines in the 80s, uh, Indonesia in the 90s and in the first decade of the 2000 21st century, and now Myanmar. And all, all I think, although they are all national development, ASEAN have made possible or create climate conducive for those national developments to take place. When I meet with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, on a number of occasions recently, what some of the conversation that we went through and discussed is how to avoid you know, uh, extreme crashes, crashes amongst extremes. The kind of bloodshed and destruction that you see in many other parts of the world. It's better to do things in a steady way, uh, but in a, 
in a purposeful way at the same time, so that when we get to the destination, uh, everyone is on board. And I think ASEAN should not be apologetic about that. I think it's a, it's a way that has worked for us. But it is certainly not, uh, doesn't mean that we become very uh, inactive on, on uh, human rights issues. So basically, it is complementary. And I think sinister there, we, we can do both. Like I said just now, walking and listening at the same time. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, I'm afraid it seems that our audience now is just warmed up and there's a sea of questions being asked, but unfortunately we really have uh, well, there are a lot of requests for us to give for one more question. Um, there was a gentleman before who did have his hand up last time around. So. Thank you very much. Uh, and those are all in Mark. I'm very impressed the star of the show. <laughs> My name is Paul. First of all, Excellency, I'd like to express your insight, insightful and precise presentation. The whole scope of transformation and changes of Indonesia, it's really wonderful. We learned a lot from Indonesia. We still learn from Indonesia. And at the same time, Your Excellency already mentioned that each and every country has a unique and special realities and situation. We have also the same. We are among the international community. At the same time, we like to express our sincere appreciation that you input to activate our transformation. I met you about two, three times in Yango before. And at that time, still stuck in that same uh, situation. But now, our transformation is doing smoothly and peacefully by the support of yourself and also by the support of our ASEAN colleagues. So we do believe and hope that your input, your wise diplomacy, will continue uh, input to our activation of transformation and particularly in, in our core organization ASEAN and uh, more than that other regional and international community. We do believe that you will continue, not only <coughs> present time, but also in the future of our process. I really appreciate your uh, kind of contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is a small comment, but I just wanted to put on record, if I may, uh, once again, how, how um, all of us are you know, very much encouraged with developments in Myanmar. Uh, I, I think it's, all, it's a two-way process, isn't it? All of us are learning from one another, uh, our, especially our problems. It's no use that, I mean, we, as I said, we have been learning from one another experience, and uh, we wish uh, Myanmar well, and uh, we, we will have Indonesia your strongest supporter in this uh, democratization path, all ASEAN family members. You will be our chair in 2014, sir. Uh, as you usher the ASEAN community in 2015. So no doubt by 2014, uh, Myanmar, more than any other ASEAN countries, will be out there championing uh, democracy for our region. Thank you very much.